PowerPoint for yeah this was the one I hope this was the one oops, oops somebody has come now Paran Agdus is a late comer 935 okay Uh, what was, the, was this the chapter? Engine oil grains. Here you are. Okay. Manohar, is this right? This was the page. Yes. You are yet uh, come to one before is. Okay. That was the uh, usual thing that the engines do. Okay. Let's go and finish this and we'll start on to um, medium speed diesel engines. You'll have to catch up with the other sections also. The engine oil grades introduction. Lubricating oils in engines can be of various viscosities. That everybody knows. This property is the key factor in ensuring satisfactory health, running conditions, and clearances between contact surfaces of all parts of the machinery. I had told you earlier also hydrodynamic lubrication that there were four parameters. And the most important one was the viscosity of the oil. Apart from the viscosity of the oil, you had clearance, speed, and the load. These are the four parameters essential for satisfactory hydrodynamic lubrication. I hope you remember all four because a question can be put to you. Which of the following four is the most important parameter for satisfactory hydrodynamic lubrication? And I'll give you all four. And then you will have to choose one. That sort of a question may come up. OK? Lubricating oils principally come in two grades, monograde oils and multigrade oils. All right. Monograde and multigrade. Pay full attention because one time you go through this, you never need to come back again. You'll remember for the rest of your life. So you have monograde and multigrade. Further, the Society of Automotive Engineers, that is the organization which decides on grading various oils. It is an American organization and parallel to that india also has its own organization it's called bureau of indian standards bis similarly england has got britain has got france has got japan has got every country has got its own uh, organization which sets the certain standards of lubricating oil these oils are now available in indian oil corporation or hindustan petroleum the grades of the oils have given a different name, but ultimately they are in sequence or in uh, correspondence with the Society of Automotive Engineers. They have a matching, but the name, the grade, the number may be a little different. All right. So Society of Automobile Automotive Engineers is the one that decides on various grades of oil, lubricating oils in particular. They identify oils as summer grades and winter grades. Summer grades don't have any letter to follow it, but winter grade has the letter W attached to it. Okay. The summer grades are more viscous, they are the thicker grade of oil, and the winter grades are less viscous or thin oils. That means during winter, they can flow more easily. And during summer, you can have thicker oils because it is hot as it is, so they will flow automatically. So winter grade oil means very thin oils. Okay. The summer grades are more viscous or thicker, and the winter grades are less viscous or thin oil. While monograde is a single summer or winter oil. So before first we said that monograde and multigrade. Monograde can be either winter or summer, but it is only winter or only summer. Okay. Multigrade is a combination of summer and winter grades together. Okay. So it is giving you the benefit of using the oil in very cold climate as well as very hot climate. The winter grade gives you a lubricating oil which can be used only in very cold climates okay summer grade oils are the oils which are used in very high temperature areas india is one of them 
okay now if you have a machine which is going to be used in very cold climate also and then again very hot climate also then you require a combination of the two oils so you need a multi grade oil all right in the engine room of a ship we are always warm so we don't use any multi grade oils here we use only mono grade oils in the engine room outside the engine room on the deck or in the accommodation places where the ship may go into very cold climates like north atlantic the temperatures might come down to 0 1 2 5 degree centigrade so there you need an oil which will be compatible so that means you will need a multi grade oil there that means thin oil and the same ship when it comes to tropical areas the temperature is again high so you need summer oil so the best option is to have a mix of winter grade and summer grade oil especially on machines which are out on the deck like your lifeboat engine your emergency generator your rescue boats these are engines which can be used in very cold climates also inside the engine room you don't need and you don't get multi grade oils all right the vehicles on the road they are using multi grade oil and sometimes they are using synthetic oils we will come to that just now okay so so far you know that what is a mono grade oil and what is a multi grade oil a mono grade oil can be summer oil or it can be a winter oil winter oil is the one that is very thin and it can be used in very cold climate so it is very fluid whereas summer oil it is a thick viscous oil and it is to be used in only summer type of climate machines which go from very cold climate to very hot climate you can use a mixture of the two oils where a winter oil and a summer oil are mixed together and it gives you a multi grade oil so that oil can be used in very cold climate also in very hot climate all right very very clear next move on engine oil summer and winter are differentiated on the basis of their viscosities okay that means the summer oil has got different grades of viscosity winter oil has also got different grades of viscosity so different engine oils have different viscosities at room temperature and also react differently to temperature changes okay moment you heat an oil it changes its viscosity so that is also has to be considered selecting an engine oil base grade is based on see now this is a very important part on what basis do you select an oil for an engine it is here selecting an oil grade is based on design running conditions such as temperature limitations loading of the components surface speeds dimensions clearances and more these are some of the parameters that the designer considers when recommending a particular grade of oil okay there are many more factors which actually are mathematical derivations and the decision on using a particular grade of oil is recommended but these are the basic that it is based on design running conditions such as temperature limitations load loading of the components surface speeds dimensions clearances and a few more which are beyond the scope of us delving into they are mathematical calculations when an engine starts the oil is cold and thick this is usually for the auxiliary engines auxiliary engines and engines which are not like your main engine your main engine we have a Uh, have a standing condition or rule to keep the oil hot and that is by keeping the lube oil purifier running continuously and that lube oil purifier is keeping the temperature at 75 degree centigrade so the oil inside the sump tank is always hot so when you start the pump you get normal pressure immediately okay but in your auxiliary engine which is lying idle there is no heating arrangement for the lubricating oil in the sump okay so when you start the generator because the oil especially in cold climate not so much in our indian climate but when the ship is in a very cold climate say in 
north of Russia, Finland, Sweden, Norway, all these places, the oil is very cold. So when the pump starts, it has to pump that thick oil, the pressure becomes very high. Now, as the pressure keeps reducing, uh, sorry, as the viscosity keeps reducing, because the temperature keeps rising, the pressure will also come down and will come to a certain level. So that viscosity at say 60 degrees centigrade remains steady because it's not going above 60 degrees centigrade when coming out from the engine. So it will remain steady. Now, uh, uh, where, uh, that is why he's saying when the engine starts, the oil is thick and cold and requires a thin oil. After a period of running as the oil heats up, it becomes thinner. Okay. In the case of a generator, initially the pressure is 6 bar because it is reasonably cold, but it comes to 4. So it is still acceptable. But when you have a lifeboat engine or an emergency generator, which is where the temperature is 3 degrees, 2 degrees, 1 degree centigrade, there the oil will be very thick because the temperature is very low. In the engine room or the auxiliary engine, at most the temperature will be 35 to 40 degrees and 35 30 degrees it cannot go down below 30 degrees centigrade so 30 degrees centigrade does not require a very uh, fluid level it is already fluid but the oil temperature has to go up from 30 degrees to 60 degrees so during that period the pressure will go from 6 bar to about 4 bar but for a very cold area like your lifeboat engine or emergency generator or your rescue boat engine, the temperature is 1 degree, 2 degree centigrade. So the oil has to be thin. All right. So there you need that oil to be thin. So you use winter grade oil mixed with summer grade oil. Because again, when that ship comes to a hot climate, outside temperature is 40 degree centigrade. So you don't need the winter oil, but you need the summer oil. So the mixture of summer and winter gives you the facility to use a machine in very cold climate as very hot as well as very hot climate. So when the engine starts, the oil is cold and thick and requires a thin oil. After a period of running, as the oil heats up, it becomes thinner. Okay. The requirement is an optimum value of the viscosity at normal load conditions. All right, you need to have a balanced value of viscosity at normal load condition. This calls for a combination of the summer and winter grade oils. That means a mixture. The summer oil is simply denoted by its viscosity grade or number, while the winter oil use the letter oil use the letter W. Therefore, there is one set winter which measures cold temperature performance that means the winter grade oils they have their different categories of viscosity the thinnest oil is 0w little less thinner oil is 5w still less 10w and then 15w and 20w these are the grades of winter oil 0w being almost like D, uh, light diesel oil or kerosene it is very thin and it will not even cold temperature will not make it very thick okay the second set of summer oils of measurement is for high temperature performance that means when the engine is very hot that is the time this lubricating oil will be functional 8 16 20 30 40 50 on board the ship we don't have 8 12 16 on board we have 20 is also very rare i don't remember 20 maybe it is there for the smaller engine emergency compressor with an engine will probably have 20 but 30 40 50 is most common for gear oils out on the deck for your winch gears they may have sae 70 or sae 90 there are oils which go up to SAE 120 also. So these are different grades of summer oils indicating their viscosity. The cylinder oil that we use for lubricating the main engine cylinder liner is SAE 50. 
and the crankcase oil that I have used has always been SAE 40. Though some auxiliary engines are using SAE 30. So your crankcase oil is generally SAE 40. For auxiliary engines, it is sometimes SAE 30, sometimes AE 40. Okay. So the crankcase oil for main engine and auxiliary engine is sometimes the same. Okay. Sometimes it may be different. Actually, the auxiliary engines, which are more towards the higher speed, they will use 30. That means faster the speed, thinner the oil should be. It cannot afford to be very thick. So this is a thumb rule. Faster the engine, thinner the, the system oil. OK. Next, what does SAE 20W40 mean? in an engine oil okay what is it now this is how the oil is graded a multi-grade oil will have sae 20 w40 that means 20 is the grade for the winter oil and 40 is the grade for the summer oil so it is a combination of the two so sae 20 w40 is a multi-grade oil okay okay the engine oil consists of four characters here we explain the meaning of each of them. The first number is followed by a W. Actually, SAE, everybody knows what SAE is. So I have not put SAE there. SAE means Society of Automotive Engineers. All right. OK, don't forget this. If anybody has a question, please put it on the uh, chat column. Okay, I have not put this one up as yet. Okay. The first number is followed by a letter W. See, 20 and then W. It means W stands for winter and represents how the oil will react to a cold start. When it is cold, it will have thin oil to allow for the lubrication. Okay. In simple word, the number with the W represents the parameter of how the oil will flow in cold conditions. Now, when you start an engine with air or battery or whatever, initially the shaft is resting on the bearing. So there is no oil between the two surfaces. So only when the shaft starts rotating or when the engine starts rotating, then the pump, which is engine driven, will generate the lube oil pressure. And then that lube oil has to travel all the way and come to the bearing. All right. So initially, if the oil is very thick, then the pump will not be able to pump the oil. So if you have a thinner medium inside the lubricating oil, the pump will immediately start pumping the oil and it will send the oil immediately to the bearing. So the chances of that bearing running dry for some period of time is minimized. So the oil supply to that bearing is immediate or almost immediate. But remember, starting and stopping of an engine is the time when there is maximum wear and tear. Because that is the time when the pump is not running and the shaft is making full contact on the surface. So when it starts running, initial movement is metal to metal. And then the oil comes there between the shaft and the bearing and form the film of oil. So during starting, and during stopping, I had told you in your hydrodynamic lubrication. It's come now. Somebody has come. Hey, why did it ring? OK. Um, what I was saying, in the starting time, the shaft is making contact with the metal. And again, during stopping time, the revolutions gradually come to a stop it doesn't stop suddenly so as the revolutions come to a stop the relative speed between the shaft and the bearing comes down from 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 0 so when it comes to the lower speed there is no oil going into the bearing i had told you the four parameters which are responsible for satisfactory lubrication where speed of the shaft was one of the criteria for having the oil into. If it is too slow, 
no oil will be able to get in. It will get pushed out from the side. The oil will not be able to come in. So during starting and stopping, you have the maximum wear and tear of the shaft of the engine. Okay. Okay. The smaller the number, better will be the oil flow. So if you have a thin oil mix, the flow of the oil will be better. So if you have uh, the smaller the number, the better will be the oil flow. That means 0W is the thinnest oil. So that oil will travel fastest to the bearing if required. But then there are other factors and parameters which have to be taken into consideration before the designer can give you 0W, 10W, or 5W, or 15W. There are other parameters also to be concerned. So the, if the oil has got a winter grade, it will come very quickly to the bearing and uh, lubrication will start. For instance, a 5W30 oil will have better cold flow than 10W30 engine oil. All right. So that is what it means. 30 is the summer oil. That is fixed. But in a cold condition, when the engine is in a very cold climate, between 10W and 5W, 5W is the thinner oil. So the chances of the thin oil to travel to the bearing is much faster. So it will have a better cold flow characteristic. The number of in the following part is the indication of how the, finally the oil will flow at normal operating temperature once it is achieved. The 10W30 engine oil will have better flow than 10W40 engine oil at normal operating temperature. So these are multi-grade oils which are used for engines which are operating in very cold climates. In fact, they can operate in cold climate as well as hot climate. The provision to supply the oil as quickly as possible in cold climate is provided by having a winter grade oil mixed with the summer grade oil. In the engine room, the multi-grade oil or winter grade oil is not required. Engine room is warm enough not to require. Only in very cold areas you will require. So those are your summer, winter, monograde, and multigrade oils. Okay. Next, what we have is what are the types of engine oils? In general, there are three types of engine oil. One is mineral oil. This is the most basic lubricating oil. Mineral oils are refined petroleum oil. They come from crude oil and which undergo treatment to function under a wide temperature range. Okay. These are the cheapest oils, in fact, amongst all the lubricating oil. But it doesn't mean that they are cheap. They are also quite costly because they have to go through a whole lot of refining processes. So these are cheaper than the other two grades of oils or other two types of oil. Now, I will use, be careful about using the term grade and type. Now, grade has already been given as summer and winter grade, monograde and multigrade. So those are indicating their viscosity. But the properties of the oils are in types of oils. Okay. Mineral oils, that means the lubricating mineral oil or mineral lubricating oil, find their use in older two-stroke diesel engines. Yes, I have used these mineral oils in my engines for system lubricating oil. And they're basic, they're simple mineral oils for lubrication, but they can have two simple additives. And these additives are anti-rust and anti-oxidation. So they are sometimes called R and O oils, okay? So this is for the system oil in the two-stroke large bore diesel engine, okay? The four-stroke diesel engine, they will also have mineral oil for their lubrication, but they will have different additives or chemicals added in it to give detergency, dispersancy, and low alkalinity. In your two-stroke engine, you don't need alkalinity. Why? Because your cylinder oil is completely separated from, or rather your combustion spaces is completely separated by means of a diaphragm and the stuffing box. So there's no scope of exhaust gases or blow past 
coming into the cranky spaces. So the chances of acidity coming in the lube oil is very low, very low. But in the case of your four-stroke engines, when there is a blow pass, your acidic gases can come in and cause damage to the lube oil. So you need that lubricating oil to be slightly alkaline. So the four-stroke system oil will have detergency, dispersancy, and low alkalinity. These are the basic. Similarly, for your two-stroke engines, anti-rust and anti-oxidation are two essential additives for your lube oil. These are the normal, simple engines. The more modern engines have much more, much more of additives in the lubricating oil. We are coming to that. Semi-synthetic oil. So for the first one was mineral oil, pure mineral oil. The second one is semi-synthetic oil. This is one diplomatic engine oil. Diplomatic. What does diplomatic mean? That means it keeps everybody happy. All right. It positions itself right in between the territorial mineral oil and the full synthetic oil. As easy to say, semi-synthetic oil is a combination which affords, offers the synthetic oil, which offers the affordability, basically the cost of the mineral oil and the performance of the synthetic oil. See, you get the, but the best of the both worlds. That means it is reasonably cheap and it performs the best. So it's a combination between the two. All right. So semi-synthetic oil is gaining use in machinery use. Semi-synthetic oil offer as much as three times the protection compared to mineral oil. So definitely it is three times better where protection is concerned for the machinery. The chances of it rusting, the chances of it not forming a film, all these things are eliminated three times when you use a semi-synthetic oil. The drawback with semi-synthetic oil is that they do not offer the superior level of protection that a fully synthetic oil does. All right. That means it is not as good as the fully synthetic oil, but it is definitely better than the pure mineral oil. So it is in between pure mineral oil and fully synthetic oil. It takes care of the cost and it gives a lot of protection, a lot more of protection than what the mineral oil does. Okay. Now we go to fully synthetic oils. The cutting edge in engine oil technology, full synthetic engine oil delivers excellent protection and aids in better fuel efficiency. Only trouble is they are very costly, very, very costly. Synthetic oils go through extensive treatment in the laboratory or actually in large scale, it will be refinery to make them significantly superior to their counterparts. That means why is synthetic oil so much better than your mineral oil? Because the process of refining this oil is much more detailed, much, much more detailed. And that is what makes the cost so high. And they are definitely much more slippery than your pure mineral oil. And another big advantage is they never oxidize. They don't change color. You see, if you see synthetic oil in a bottle, it looks like coconut oil, plain coconut oil. It is transparent, not even translucent. It is transparent, but it has the same viscosity as mineral oil viscosity is the same only thing a pure mineral oil is just like the same color as honey as clear transparent but it is color of honey whereas the synthetic oil is like glycerin or if you say coconut oil absolutely transparent filtered coconut oil it looks like that but once you put it on your finger, you find it is much more slippery, very slippery, very good lubricating ability. 
So synthetic oils go through extensive treatment in the laboratory to make them significantly superior to their counterparts. The process involves breaking down the mineral oil into the most basic molecules, which helps to remove any undesired substances and impurities to a very high degree. So it is completely a chemical process of removing some molecules from that oil to leave you with the molecules which are synthetic in nature and very consistent in their size and shape, offering superior lubrication. It is true, some of these uh, lubricating oils, synthetic lubricating oils, they are superlative. Even if you put one drop, you can use this for even your small machinery and in your small motors, small equipment where lubrication is required. They work brilliantly, brilliantly. If you were to make your models and if you were having machines, basically one little bottle of synthetic oil will perform miracles in lowering the resistance of rotation of any little motors, the shaft, etc. The battery operated equipment at home, you use just one drop at the end of a screwdriver, one drop and you use, they work brilliantly. Um, okay, where were we? Uh, the process involves breaking down the mineral oil into the most basic molecules, which helps remove any undesired substances and impurities to a very high degree. The molecules of synthetic oil are very consistent in their size and shape, offering superior lubrication. Full synthetic oil function at their optimum in both low or high temperatures under extraordinary stress. That means they can work in low temperatures and in high temperatures with extreme ease. And the best, biggest advantage is that they don't oxidize. And because they don't oxidize, they are used mainly in air compressors. On board the ship, the only equipment that is permitted to be using synthetic oil is the air compressor. I will tell you why. Uh, normally, I put the question to the boys, but I will tell you forehand because we need to finish it quickly. You see, air compressor is like an engine, just like an engine. It's got a piston, it's got a connecting rod, it's got a crankshaft, etc. But instead of transmitting power, it takes power from the electric motor. So the electric motor is rotating the crankshaft and the piston is compressing the air. Now, when it compresses the air, the air reaches very high temperatures about 200 degrees centigrade sometimes i suppose to i've never measured but about 200 degrees centigrade now at that temperature which is the normal flash point of lubricating oil in the close vicinity of flash point the oil starts to carbonize okay it's just changing br dark brown more brown more brown and then black black means carbonized this carbon which forms, if it forms a solid, it goes and gets stuck between the valve seats, the suction, discharge valve seats. Now, the discharge valves of an air compressor are very, very precision equipment. That means they have very fine tolerances. That means the clearances should be negligible when the seating is there. It must seat 100%. If there is a small speck of dirt between the valve and the seat, there will not be a non-return valve. Air will go this way and it will go back again because the valve will not be able to sit. If it doesn't sit because there is a small particle over there, let's see this is a small particle, it goes and gets stuck there. So the valve cannot close. If it doesn't close, then it is the non-return non function of the valve is lost. So that is why. We use an oil which will not carbonize. And if it doesn't carbonize, then the, there'll be no carbon setting between the valves and the seat. So that is one of the biggest advantages and benefits that we can use synthetic oil. So we don't need to overhaul or open up the compressor very often for overhauling of the valves. Otherwise, previously when they were using mineral oil, every port, they had to open the valve, overhaul it, and again put it back. See, because 
the importance of the air compressor can never be overstressed because without that air compressor you cannot run your engine you need to fill up your air bottles every time and during maneuvering you require to stop and start stop and start the engine so every time you start the engine you need fresh air that air is stored in the air bottle now if the compressor is not able to deliver the required quantity of air to the air bottle at 30 bar pressure after some time the compressor will be running but there'll be no air in the air bottle so that has happened to a lot of ships and then they become immobilized then the ship cannot run because once you start stop you don't have air the compressor is not building up pressure and why is it not building up pressure because those valves inside the air compressor are not closing why are they not closing because of carbon formation in the oil it is getting overheated and the carbon particles are sitting between the valves and the seats so the compressor was not working you have to open up the valve clean them clean the piston take out the piston piston grooves are also full of carbon so those carbon may come into the valve so it was a nuisance to use mineral oil for your air compressors so that is why synthetic oils have been recommended and thereafter after using synthetic oil compressors are running very happy no problem okay so that is why you use synthetic oils okay additives in lubricating oils additives are chemicals and they are complex very very complex chemicals i told you research in improving technology with engines is not enough you need to have research with the lubricant with the medium which is going to run between the two running surfaces that lubricant also has to technically evolve and once you have technically evolved lubrication then you can run the engine at higher loads higher temperatures higher speeds etc but there has to be an improvement in the quality of the lubricant between the two surfaces so how do we go about improving the lubri uh, lubricant basically by adding chemicals which will enhance the ability of the oil to perform so additives in lubricating oils comes into play so there is more to lubricants than just viscosity in the earlier stages i told you viscosity is the most important parameter but as we are evolving technology technologically and machines are coming out to perform faster higher better you need to have better lubricants between them so viscosity alone is not going to suffice you need to have other param other factors which have to be improved upon okay so there is more to lubricants than just viscosity additives are chemical compounds which are added to improve the protection of the components and increase life of the oil by that life of the lubricant that has to be there is further increased how by giving properties which the oil does not have you see basic oil which comes as a mineral oil it does not have property of detergency dispersancy and uh, oxid anti-oxidation anti-rust it doesn't so we give properties into that oil okay Apart from this, we replace the desirable properties that may have been removed during refining. See, during refining, the temperature or the pour point of that oil may have gone high. In other words, the ability of that oil to pour as after refining is say 6 degrees centigrade. Before refining, it was 3 degrees centigrade. So during refining, some property has been lost. Okay, So we put chemicals in it to get back those properties. That means replacing desirable properties that may have been removed during refining. Refining of that crude oil can change certain properties, but we need those properties. So that can be done by adding chemicals into it. 
it is all about adding chemicals and you will be surprised at the number of chemicals that are added in today's lubricating oil and it is not just about adding the chemical you have to add the chemical and then see that that chemical does not do damage to another property so it calls for a lot of research and this research is being done in laboratories much like your uh, vaccine similar similar to the vaccine research lubricating oil uh, research is also in process apart from this it also has giving it properties by enhancing the performance of the basic lubricating oil it means it can sustain much higher temperatures it cannot change the viscosity of the oil if it is going into such high temperatures and then when it is turning inside the engine it will not form foam it will not form lather otherwise the pump will start drawing lather so anti foam characteristics is there then there is additive where the oil it will stick to the surface so that any piston ring pressure on the liner will cannot squeeze out that oil from there it will remain there these are extended pressure oils so nowadays chemicals can perform magic chemicals on board can perform magic and ships are usually loaded with chemicals and they keep coming in drums vast range of chemicals you have to be very careful about contacting these chemicals with your hands because these chemicals are sometimes very damaging to the skin and possibility you will land up with even skin cancer if you are not careful so be very very careful with the chemicals that come on board ships in today's world additives have three basic roles enhancing existing basic oil properties that is understandable that means the properties are even improved with antioxidants corrosion inhibitors anti foam agents and demulsifying agents these are all your chemicals which are added to get prop these properties that means you get these properties from the oil it will not oxidize it will not cause corrosion even if it becomes uh, having some acidity in it then uh, anti foam it will not form foam and they will not have a tendency to mix with the water demulsifying agents next is suppress undesirable basic oil properties just a minute please suppress undesirable basic oil properties with pore point depressant and viscosity index improvers now pore point depressants is suppose the oil that you have lubricating oil the summer grade it is not pumpable even at 6 degrees centigrade all right sometimes the ship will go to 6 degrees centigrade it cannot be pumped so what do you do you put anti uh, you put pore point depressant it's a chemical added so that pore point temperature from 6 degrees goes down to 1 degree centigrade so even if the temperature of the oil is 1 degree or 2 degree centigrade pump can pump that oil so these are pore point depressants it depresses the pore point even lower pore point is the temperature at which the oil can be poured or it can be pumped all right viscosity index improvers now viscosity index it sounds like a number it is not a number really it is a property viscosity index is a property and that property is the resistance to change in viscosity with change in temperature so you need to put in some chemicals which will improve this property in other words if this chemical is put inside the viscosity index improves that means the possibility or the change in viscosity with change in temperature will not happen otherwise you see our bearing i told you is designed with these four parameters where viscosity determines the film thickness now if the viscosity changes because of the temperature then that film thickness will change so you will not have the correct lubrication so that is why the lubricating oil has been put with chemicals 
where the viscosity will not change even if there is a change in temperature. And that is called viscosity index improver. Okay. Next is import new properties to the basic mineral oil. Okay. That means it will give new properties to the oil, to the basic mineral oil. First one we saw was enhance the existing. Another one is suppressed undesirable property. Third one is impart new properties to the basic mineral oil with extreme pressure additives. Now, extreme pressure additive is also a chemical which is added in the oil. And that oil, when it comes on the surface, very high loading on the surface will not shift that oil from there. There will be a thicker film of oil if it is an EP oil uh, instead of an ordinary mineral oil. That means if you are using a lubricating oil which has got the EP additive, that means that loading on that surface can be much higher. Your cylinder oils in the modern engines are EP oils. Apart from being alkaline, they also are extreme pressure oils, which means the force of the piston ring on the surface will still retain that oil on between the two. Any other bearing which is under very high load, they may be able to use EP oils or extreme pressure oils. And EP additives are chemicals, very complex chemicals. I will not confuse you with more chemicals because your syllabus has no, uh, it just says types of additives, nothing else. So all you need to know what are additives? Additives are chemical. Why they are added? These are the reasons why they are added. And what are the... Uh, one sec. Here it is. I have not finished this. Extreme pressure additives, detergents. Now, detergents is also a property given to the oil. And it is ability to clean. That I told you before. Detergency. Second one is metal deactivators and tackiness agents. Now, metal deactivators. You don't need to be very thorough with this part, but metal deactivators, you see what it means. In the oil, whenever there is acid formation, the acid has got a metal and a non-metal component in the molecules. Now, this metal component is deactivated which means that acidic effect of the oil is removed. So that is why it is called a metal deactivator. The acid has the metal, con uh, metal element in it and the non-metal element in it. So this metal element is deactivated. So the acidic function of that chemical or that uh, acid is redundant. In other words, any acidic reaction within the oil is neutralized. It is not alkali. It is not an alkali. It is a special agent which will remove the, even the microscopic levels of acidity. Next, next is tackiness agents. Now, here is your explanation for tackiness agents. They are polar additives that attach to the frictional metal surfaces. They react chemically with the metal surfaces when metal to metal contact occurs in conditions mixed and boundary lubrication. They are activated by heat of contact to form a film that minimizes wear. Now, all this was not really required, but I, since there is the term tackiness agents, I wanted you to be very clear. Now, what happens is in boundary lubrication, boundary lubrication is a condition where there is some oil and some of metal contact also. Both are there. So to help in retaining the oil molecules, the stackiness agents are used. That means they hold on to the surface with enormous amount of power arising out of its polar nature. Polar nature means each of these molecules has got, or rather particles, has got a north pole and south pole. So moment they are polar, they will attach themselves. So a north pole will attach to a south pole and a south pole will attach to a north pole. So 
the smallest particles of the lubricating oil will remain there it will hold in it is something like your ep additive similar but they are called tackiness agents tackiness means sticky it sticks to the surface okay next is metal deactivators here you are these metal deactivators are actually fuel additives and oil additives that means they can be added in the fuel also they can be added in the lubricating oil also they are used to stabilize fluids by deactivating or uh, sequestering metal ions mostly introduced by action of naturally occurring acids in the fuel and the acids generated in the lubricants by oxidative processes which the metallic parts of the systems fuel desulfurized by copper sweetening also contain a significant trace of amounts of copper you forget about this this thing is not to be memorized not to be learned not to be it is only for your extra information required see i have not even put a uh, thing to it advanced additives one thing additives This actually was more for me than for you. This is going, not going to have any bearing in your exams or your questions. I will not put up questions from here. This is just to give you an additional information on the additives that are utilized in the yeah so metal deactivator metal deactivators are also used tachinous agents are also used in this particular here imparting new properties to the basic mineral oil if you remember just ep oil ep additives detergents just the name is enough and tachinous agents okay forget about the detail now this is something you need to know i have given you nine of them and the last one eight has got two of these additives you need to know the names of all these additives antioxidant is one additive corrosion inhibitors additive detergency additive dispersancy four point depressant viscosity index improvers anti-foaming additives oiliness and extreme pressure additives these you will need to have at your fingertips what are the additives used in lubricating oils in the modern diesel engines antioxidant it helps in reducing the oxidation process of the oil that means the oil has a longer lifespan the oil need not be heated to get oxidized the oil only needs to be exposed to the atmosphere to get oxidized everything gets oxidized you see this paper after five years if you see it it has become brown why why five years one year later you will see it has become brown why because the oxygen from the air has caused an oxidation process which is sometimes termed aging process so you need chemicals in the oil which will reduce this aging process and help in keeping the oil usable okay next is corrosion inhibitors that means the level of corrosion is also reduced I'm not going to give you that chart with all the chemicals in it. It will only cause more confusion. But there was one very bright boy in the batch. And he was the president's gold medalist. I had just given that chart very casually for the sake of extra information to keep them aware that these are the chemicals which are added in oils as improvement in the performance of the oil this boy he learned everything up and when the examination came they write short notes on additives and lubricating oil he wrote the whole thing i was very impressed with him that the, that list of chemicals is not easy to mug up not easy to remember not easy to uh, quote in an examination but this boy did it I was pretty amazed. But anyway, the boy finally, he went to University of Berkeley, he went to 
Asian Institute of Maritime Studies, and he's somewhere very high up now. He's a very good boy, Rahul Kohilo. So detergency, you all know what detergency is about. You know what is dispersancy about poor point depression. Now, you see, uh, the information I have got is that you will be sitting for a semester examination where there will be multi-choice questions, many of them. So I could write the additive dispersancy means, and I'll give you different meanings. And out of that, you'll have to pick one. So I can choose 1,000 questions from just this plate alone as your multi-choice questions. So have every information down to understanding completely. Don't leave anything. You must know the meaning of detergency. You must know the meaning of dispersancy correctly, not approximately, correctly. You must know the meaning of depot point depressants. It means it changes the temperature at which the pump can pump the oil or pour the oil, if you can pour the oil from a glass or tumbler or anything, from six degrees or two, zero degrees or one degree or minus four degrees, any temperature. So it helps in allowing the pump to pump the oil. That is the intention of pour point depressant. There was another one, another temperature I had given you. How have I given you? Cloud point. What is cloud point? Let's see who can answer this question. I'm getting a little monotonous in my monologue. Um, let's see whom should I ask? Uh, Manohar Singh. Manohar, what is cloud point? Sir, I cannot recall it now. My goodness. I, if you were, I would have made you stand up on your table if it was in the class. It's a shame. Anyway, cloud point is the temperature of an oil, particularly fuel, where the wax crystallizes. See, as you lower the temperature of a fuel oil, it has got paraffinic components. This paraffinic component solidifies, and this solidification is wax formation this wax formation the temperature at which this wax starts crystallizing is called cloud point and what is the problem the problem is when this oil you try to pump it the wax will go and block the filter because it's semi-solid it goes and blocks the solid it blocks the filter so cloud point is the temperature at which the wax in the fuel crystallizes and forms a semi-solid mass, which prevents the oil transfer or oil pumping through the pipelines. It's a very important temperature for those people up in the north, northern hemisphere of the globe, where the temperatures are zero degrees, one degree, minus two degrees. There they have a lot of problem in pumping oil, transferring oil from one place to another. We in India, we have no problems about temperature. We are always in a hot climate. And sometimes we complain about the hot climate. You would be, if you were in very cold climate, you would be complaining 10 times more. It is so difficult to live in a cold climate. It is much easier to survive in a hot climate. You don't need room heating. You don't need insulation. You don't need clothes and clothes and clothes. You don't need shoes. You can always have a bath as many times as you want. In cold climate, you cannot have a bath. You cannot expose yourself unless you have hot water. And if there is no electricity, you'll be freezing. It's not easy. Surviving in a cold climate is not easy. We are very easily, and also vegetables grow, plants grow so much easily. Now, what, who was that now? Nobody. OK. So. Uh, poor, uh, 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 where were we? Poor point of viscosity index improver. It means you put a chemical that uh, we don't put, it is the manufacturers and the laboratories and the oil manufacturers. They are the ones who have, add the chemicals in the lu lubricating oil or the fuel oil. On board the ship, you add nothing. You add nothing. You get the oils in the way they are. The only thing you add is possibly in the fuel oil. 
fuel oil, you write FOT, fuel oil treatment. That means it will not allow the sludge to settle. In other words, it will be fluid. Fuel oil treatment, FOT. I don't know what the chemical is, but it helps in keeping the fuel oil more in a fluid state. That is the only treatment we give on the ship. Otherwise, there's no other. Lubricating oils, they are already pre-mixed, ready for your immediate use. You don't put anything in it. Never make the mention of add more alkali. On board the ship, you don't put any alkali, any chemical in any lube oil. It comes pre-mixed. Everything is made for immediate use. All right. If the uh, uh, alkali level goes down in the oil, you have to change that oil. You cannot put alkali and increase the oil, increase the alkalinity of the oil. Never. There is no such thing as alkali in, on board the ship to be put in the oil. If the alkali level of an oil goes down, you need to change the oil. And which oil is that? That is the oil for your auxiliary engines, system oil. The alkali level will go down because your blow pass from the engine will go and contaminate that oil. So after a certain time, change the oil. That is why in four-stroke engines, you have to have to change the oil without question after a stipulated running period. Okay. Next you have is the uh, viscosity index improver that I told you change in viscosity with change in temperature. Then you have anti-foaming additive. Now these oils are principally used in air conditioning and refrigeration compressors. Because that oil, it is mixed with the freon gas or the refrigerant gas. So when it is churning inside the crankcase, the gas sometimes comes out from that oil and you will see in the crankcase, there is a side glass. You will be able to see a lot of foam formation. Okay. Now, if the whole mass of oil inside the crankcase becomes foam, then the pump which is going to draw the oil will be drawing the foam. So you need special chemicals in that oil which will not allow foam formation so those are called anti-foaming additives and they are used in mainly refrigerant lubricating oils in other words lubricating oils in the air in the refrigeration compressors okay oiliness and extreme pressure additives oiliness is to improve the oiliness factor in the oil that means a reduced friction is achieved by adding chemical uh, additives which help in reducing or improving the oiliness. Extreme pressure additives are oils which have a capability of sustaining their film of oil even under very high loads. Cylinder oil is one of them and certain bearings which are subject to very high loads. But mainly you will come across in cylinder oils because piston rings are one which have an extreme pressure requirement. Okay. Okay. So that will be all for your uh, lubrication part of it. And you will need to um, go over that. I will share this lecture with you. Let us go on to our, our new PowerPoint, which is medium speed diesel engines. Okay, if you have any questions, you can put it up. Let us start with this, otherwise we will be falling backward. Medium speed engines, most of it is already known to you regarding the construction details. Now here we, go, we are going to deal with a little different part of the medium speed engines. The uses, the advantages, etc. The gearing, how the gears are fitted to medium speed engines, etc. Let's move on. Let's start. So far, no questions. Okay. Medium speed engines are generally are of the four-stroke cycle. This refers to engines of speed range 300 to 800 RPM. Now, this is not a hard and fast truth that it has to be between 300 and 800. It can become 290 also and 850 also or even 900 also. So there is no hard and fast rule that this range. This gives you a guideline to where it stands approximately. A medium speed engine will be between 300 and 800 RPM. Okay. Now, if it is 850 RPM, you don't call it a high speed engine immediately. 
it is what the manufacturer will specify that this particular engine is high speed or is it medium speed okay high speed engines run at usually 1000 rpm and higher okay presently medium speed engines are also used as main propulsion units earlier in my time there were very few medium speed engines being used for propulsion of large ships no only the two stroke big engines were used for propulsion of large engines today medium speed engines are also being used for propulsion of large ships why because heavy oil can be burned on medium speed engines also and they do offer some advantages okay uh, reduction gearing required for medium speed engine propulsion as propellers run at lower speeds See, you have a very large ship you have a very large propeller larger the propeller slower is the rpm to get its maximum efficiency so now you have propellers for large ships which are running at 95 rpm anything between 95 rpm and 120 130 rpm uh, is the rpm of a propeller which is running at a very high speed uh, sorry at a low speed Oof. this monologue is not easy continuous monologue tend to get tired a bit reduction gearing is required for medium speed engine propulsion as propellers run at slower speeds the medium speed engines i told you are between 300 and 800 rpm usually they are 500 to 600 for large ships usually now if it is 500 to 600 in the large ships your propeller is at 95 rpm let me change this and i'll put a hertz the earphones hurt let me put no this is better that thing sticks into the ear okay so reduction gearing is used for medium speed engines as the propellers run at slower speeds propeller is 95 rpm your engine is running at 500 600 rpm so you need a reduction gearing between the two okay okay residual fuel is used in medium speed engines up to 750 rpm now this is a very important statement in my time we were told medium speed engines cannot run on heavy oil but with the price of oil going up 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 now they had to do some research and they made changes in the design of the fuel pump of the fuel injectors of the heating systems cooling arrangements etc and then they found that medium speed engines can run on heavy fuel but it is a slower running medium speed engine that means up to 750 rpm you can run medium speed engines on heavy oil anything above 750 rpm the time is not adequate for the fuel to burn completely by the time the piston reaches its bottom of the stroke so even if the engine is perfect you can run it on heavy oil and if it is above 750 rpm you will be getting black smoke which means the fuel will not have burnt before it exits from the engine so up to 750 rpm they have accepted that medium speed engines can run on residual fuel okay a lot of research analysis and that also your atomization uh, viscosity of the oil the speed of the engine everything has to be matched with each other then only you can burn that heavy oil completely and there also there are certain grades of fuel oil if you remember in fifth semester I had given you the various grades IS8217. You remember what does IS8217 refer to? It is the grades of fuel oil. I would suggest you go through your fifth semester notes also 
and keep those in fifth semester you are studied mostly the fundamentals those fundamentals are as important as your later studies so there will be possibly some questions from there also okay okay let's move on multitude number of manufacturers of medium speed engines in the two stroke engines there were only three manufacturers watsila and salzer man and bnw and mitsubishi three watsila and salzer man and bnw mitsubishi alone japanese so these are the three manufacturers of two stroke large bore diesel engines your medium speed engines there are maybe 100 of them so i cannot give you a list of all the manufacturers but there must be about 100 of them and all are good manufacturers the existing two stroke engine manufacturers are also manufacturing four stroke engines now watsila and sulder independently they are manufacturing sulder engines and watsila engines these are your four stroke medium speed engines jointly they are making the two stroke engines two stroke engine manufacture is i guess much much more difficult that's why so next is pro propulsion units a ship owner now some of you will be a ship owner at some stage of your lives some of you we must keep that hope also so as a ship owner what is the type of engine you would like to have on your ship of course the sh when you, once you become a ship owner your engine is not your priority your your profit is your priority that means the bottom line is your priority so you will want to carry more cargo and keep little space for your engine but the engine has to have certain properties or certain uh, uh, features those features must give you the maximum advantage in transporting your cargo from point a to point b without any issues to give you the best profit okay so what are those features you would like to have now i have given you some features which are not necessarily in order of priority the priority will be left to you so a question may come to you what are the features you would like to have in an engine which is to be installed for a reefer ship or for a bulk carrier or for a tanker so that question can come to you describe in detail what features you would like to have for a ship like a general cargo ship so you will have to put down those features and those features are listed here and they are not necessarily in order of priority you will think which is the most important and then put it at the first in order of priority so let's go through it so the ship owner will want that engine to be small simple compact and space saving he wants best of everything so this is what he want small save simple compact and space saving space saving to enable him to get more cargo ease of maintenance now ease of maintenance doesn't mean easily opening and easily putting back it also means the spare parts cost spare parts availability spare part transportation durability of the parts and how much of time it takes to maintain what is the time period for which the engine is allowed to run before the next maintenance schedule comes up all this is encompassed in ease of maintenance all right it is not simply how easy it is to open and close that engine machine it be to all the costs that are involved in the maintenance spare parts replacement of parts availability of parts transportation of the parts durability of the parts so all these factors come in ease of maintenance okay next is high reliability yes the ship has to be very reliable and the ship can be reliable if the engines and machinery are reliable you have a contract to supply your cargo from point a to point b within so many days it has to be done you cannot delay you delay means money is gone lost why because the ship is a small cog in the entire machine of shipping that ship is only transporting cargo from here to there but 
Thereafter, there is so much of work involved. They have to book a jetty where the ship has to come. They have to book the cranes which are going to unload. They have to you book a gang of people who are going to operate the crane, fix the cargo, and then have them unloaded. Then they have to book the trucks, the the cut trucks which will carry the cargo away once it is landed on the jetty. Then they have to book the warehouse where they have to store the cargo. The number of jobs after shipping is also huge. It is not that shipping is everything. Beyond shipping, we are only a small cog wheel in the entire machinery setup of transportation. All right. So that reliability of that cog wheel has to be very high to keep all the other wheels in continuous movement. Okay. So we require that engine in the ship to be very very reliable. That is why I find that to be a very re uh, relevant uh, fe feature. Next is high power to weight ratio. Obviously, if your high power to weight ratio means the ship is going to be very light, so it can carry more cargo. So that gives you your bigger profit margin in the end. All right. Then you have low fuel and low oil consumption. This is very important from the point of the owner's view because ultimately this is a consumable product and you'll be spending money and if the engineers on board keep wasting oil and allows that oil to be wasted and dumped into the slop tank and from the slop tank it is gone in the barges of the other then you're causing a loss to the company if you want your position to improve you have to see the ship owner's position if you can improve the ship owner's position your position is also going to improve ultimately your well-being is dependent on the ship owner's well-being or the shipping ship's well-being of course ship's well-being is what is going to earn the profits and the profits are ultimately going to come to everybody else so if the ship is not making profits you will be told all right bye bye next contract we can't hire you that's the way it is so lube oil and low low lube oil and fuel oil consumption boys are you all understanding anything manohar yes sir okay uh, this monologue is very tiring you know unless i get some sort of a feedback i'm some sort of a response it's like me talking to the wall. Uh, it's a good thing that you're responding. It keeps me also a little awake. Otherwise, it's not easy. Okay, let's continue. Now, those were the uh, those were the one, two, three, four, five features you would require in a medium speed engine. Apart from this, you will require adaptable to unmanned operation. That means when the medium speed engine is built, the engine builders will make sure that this engine can be fixed with a lot of sensors, devices, pressure switches, levers, connections, etc. So that this engine is going to be used as a main engine. It can be controlled from the bridge. It can be controlled from the engine room control station. And of course, it can be controlled from the engine base as it is. So it requires facilities within that engine so that it can be having unmanned operations that means it can be remotely controlled without looking at it this is the case only for the main engine why because the cost of failure is justified by having remote controls and sensors and etc the auxiliary engines you have three of them on board you don't need that level of automation why if one fails you start the other one and fix this one. But for the main engine, you have only one engine. If it fails, the whole ship stops. So you need to put in the best. And the cost of automation is as much as cost of the engine. So at to what level can you keep adding safety features and sensing devices and all protection devices? This can come only when the cost of failure is justified that means if there is a failure and the consequential costs 
are very very high much higher than the cost of putting that uh, automation then you are requiring to have it otherwise you don't need it are you able to understand this particular point it is called the gaussian expression g a u s s i a n write it down on a piece of paper and then find out about it what it means it actually comes in management levels but get started you can get started and only get the concept that how much of is something like see this pen all right i have a pen what is purpose writing but i want to improve on it why right. i will give it a plating of gold okay gold plated so its value increases then i will put a few studs of diamonds on it oh the value is even more enhanced but what the hell is it for it all i need it is for writing if it goes out of order will that diamond and gold help it will not help so there there is a limit to how much of input i can have i can have just a pen all right but i need to protect that pen for that i make a cover and i put the cover the cover is important because if it falls the point will get spoiled so the cover is necessary after the cover you don't need anything else so there is a limit to how much of protection you can give to an item you can give up to a certain level beyond that the cost of failure is not justified that means if it when fails then what was the good idea of putting diamond and gold on it that is the concept of the gaussian curves read it up once it's very interesting once you get it for any machinery how much of protection can you put can you put five engineers behind it to keep take care of it you have to pay those five engineers you have to arrange for their fooding you have to uh, lodging boarding then the cost of feeding and boarding and lodging of those engineers is more than the cost of that engine or cost of failure of that engine if that engine fails you repair it and the cost is one tenth of one engineer that is what is has to be justified next is compatible to wide range of fuels now the ship which the ship owner is going to use it is going to go worldwide so that oil which is available in rotterdam will be little different from the one that is available in dubai which will be different from what is available in yokohama it will be different from what is available in sydney and what is different in another part so that engine has to be such that that compatibility of various oil should be within that oil that means that within that engine that means that engine can burn a wide band of different oils okay next is multiple uses over and above propulsion now when a ship owner makes an investment he puts the money into that engine it is for sending a ship from point a to point b okay what happens after he reaches point b okay he is in the harbor he is in the port and a ship is stopped engine is stopped auxiliary engines have been started to give you electricity electrical power for running your winches cargo loading unloading everything is going on what is the main engine doing oh he is sitting and doing nothing idling hey you have put money into that and he is sitting and doing nothing you are only getting back your investment returns if that engine is running 24/7 only then you are getting the return so in port you can use that engine and instead of having three auxiliary engines you get rid of one auxiliary engine you have two auxiliary engines so the cost is saved for one auxiliary engine and this main engine is going to give you your return in port also what will you do you will declutch the engine from the propeller and run that main engine to run an alternator this alternator is capable of generating electricity so that electricity is being generated at the cost of running your main engine which is burning heavy oil your auxiliary engine there are burning distillate fuel which is a costly fuel so that is one apart from this you can use this main engine with an extended shaft on the opposite side to run your cargo pumps cargo pumps are massive pumps which unload tankers of the oil and send it ashore ashore so between the engine and the pump there is a bulkhead 
and where the shaft enters there is a sealing arrangement so no gas can come from the pump room to the engine room or from the engine room to the pump room so there is a seal there so the shaft drive drives a pump which pumps the cargo oil from a tanker to shore so there you don't need a, a massive electrical motor so the chances of having sparks fire or extra cost for the motor is also eliminated if you were to have your generator running generating electricity and that electricity was used for a motor which motor will run the pump and the pump will pump the oil ashore the cost of initial cost as well as your running cost both are very high if you use this main engine for these purposes then the cost comes down ultimately the whole object of shipping is commerce all right this commerce is intended to generate profits for the ship owner so you have to look at various arrangements where the expenditure is minimum and the returns are the highest so that is why you have multiple uses of the medium speed engine over and above propulsion next is low initial cost that means after doing everything in the best possible way you want the cheapest cost now low initial cost does not mean always the cheapest it has to be low but at the same time it has to be the best material or best equipment that is being delivered because reliability does not come with cheap alternatives does it next <clears throat> there are more advantages you know sorry now we are going to go into advantages and then we'll go into disadvantages once you see the advantages you will say why not all the ships have medium speed engines they are so good so perfect so convenient then when you see the disadvantages you say no no i want to stay back with the two stroke engine that's the way it is okay so let's see what are the advantages of medium speed engine reduced height it gives more space for cargo right higher power to weight ratio more mass of cargo can be used reduction gear enables ideal propeller rpm gearing allows best propeller choice a ship is built primarily with the objective of transmitting transporting cargo so the size of the ship is fixed the huge ship to match that ship you need to have a propeller which will give adequate speed to that ship so the big propeller has to be there now <clears throat> the engine now the ship owner wants a medium speed engine there so there are various medium speed engines he will decide on a medium speed engine which is giving the best features that i told you there and then the ship builder has to match the engine with the propeller engine is 540 rpm uh, mcr whereas the propeller is 95 rpm at the highest propeller efficiency so he will choose a gearing or a gearbox which will be a convenience to the engine and convenience to the propeller so you can get the best choice of a gear to get the ideal rpm of the propeller <clears throat> oh my god it's already 11 o'clock let's finish this plate the modern trends of your diesel engine is unidirectional gear diesel with reverse reduction gear that means the medium speed engines of today's world they are all only in one direction they can't reverse only one direction if there is one direction then <clears throat> it does you do not need a stern cam you do not need a stern pilot valve cam nothing all things are reduced only in one direction the gearbox that has to be there that has the capability of changing the gears all right so you have unidirectional geared diesel with reverse reduction gear so any time you want to change the direction you change the direction on the gearbox and you have other than this you have a medium speed engine which can run a controllable pitch propeller everybody knows what is a controllable pitch propeller the blades on the boss or the hub of the propeller 
are capable of changing their angle. This comes through a basic crosshead inside the hub and with an eccentric on that crosshead. So when the crosshead moves, the eccentric moves to change the direction or the angle of the blade. So you can have the blade absolutely straight so that when the engine is running with the propeller shaft rotating, there will be no movement of the ship because there is no thrust. So changing the angle of the blade will give it a head and a stern movement. All right. So that is your controllable pitch propeller. And these are used with medium speed engines. Next is electric generator. Now, yes, medium speed engines can also be used as your electric generator. I just now told you it can be coupled directly with an alternator. And this main engine can run to give current or electricity. Mohit Shukla is calling. Just a minute, please. Hello, Mohit. I'm taking class right now. I'll, I'll, I'll take it in 11.15. I will start the class. I, I will start the practical class on compressors just now. Okay, okay, okay. So electric generator, it can be used for generating electricity. That's the way it is. Okay. Let's see what is next. Okay, it's 1106. Uh, Manohar, remember we are on page six. Sorry. We are on page five. Next class we'll start from page six. Yes, so that will be all for today. And we will try to finish as quickly as possible the medium speed engines. Then we'll go on to maintenance of diesel engines and governors. Governors is an important. Have you been taught governors as yet? Manohar? No, sir. Not at all. Sir, just a basic understanding. We have like basic definition. Definition? Yes, sir. Nothing, Nothing in detail. Oh. OK. I have a separate PowerPoint program on governors. So after medium speed engines, we'll do the governors first. And then we'll go on to maintenance. Maintenance, opening, closing. Those are actually, you have to be uh, in place. It's like a practical class. But theoretical has to be very clear. So after this, these medium speed diesel engines, we will go on to governors. And after governors, we'll do touch up on maintenance. Maintenance, I feel sometimes, unless you have the machine in front of you, uh, how can I tell you, open this nut and open this out, and this has to be closed, and this has to be fitted. It's very difficult to teach maintenance on online. Anyway, I see 38 boys in class, so 36 are actually there. 38. Who, who is not there? Um, uh, section B. Do section C, no? Okay. Uh, Paran? Yes, sir. Paran, uh, you'll have to find out who are the absentees. There are two absentees, it seems. Many, how many is this section C? Oh, there are two means. They are withdrawn cadet. 8089, 8092. Okay, 100% present. All right. Non-necessary to take attendance. Okay, bye-bye for now. Now let me go sir, on to... Sir. Uh, sorry? Uh, sir, uh, sir, do you have any idea like how this end semester exams format will be conducted? I think it is going to be largely multi-choice questions. Very little there will be on describe and sketch or diagrams or anything. Yes, I sir. think so. I think so. I cannot confirm, but I feel what I heard, what I other faculty are discussing. But you will be told. It is not that you will be kept in the dark and you will suddenly come for an exam. They will be telling you that this, I think even for the previous semester exam, you were told that there will be a part A, which will be multi-choice questions, and then part B will be a descriptive and a subjective type. Were you told that in the last semester? Yes, sir, sir. But that was very late. I mean, the exam was in February last week and we were informed in February mid. Oh, my God. OK, this time be very, very well prepared that most of the questions will be multi-choice questions. OK. Yes, sir. OK. OK. 
so take care stay safe till next class thank you sir thank you okay okay bye bye